Hi, my name's Selma and I'm based in County Galway, Hedford. I'm going to give you a quick five minute background to um, what kind of initiated the LACE project in Hedford. So in 2016, um, Hedford was chosen as a pilot town for Galway 2020 and there was a three day event, there was three art projects and this is one that I took on. Um, the brief was to uh, um, do a site specific uh, art piece through the town that led people through the town because um, it's often very empty and neglected. So I decided to look at the local history, folklore, um, and try and collect stories. I was looking at uh, the National Folklore Collection, um, talking to people, oral history, and um, just, just researching myself. And so I decided to create these little mini um, kind of uh, burr boxes, which when you opened up, there'd be like a little kind of glimpse of a bit of history or heritage. And I was working with the National School Children, and we had four weeks to do all this as well. <laughs> so um, this is one of the burr boxes that you see. and. They were, they were installed through the town. The idea was people walked through the town and they would just stumble across them and kind of have a glimpse of some kind of heritage or forgotten history. Um, there's another one here and um, here. So this is a, a detail of one of them and I'll just talk briefly about a couple of them. So in, in Hedford we have the friary, the Ross Erley friary. Um, it's from the 11th century and this, this writing is from the, the National Folklore Collection and um, there's a legend attached to this uh, friary that uh, these swans built a flaxen nest and when they landed it was an omen to build this friary and this is still talked about and um, when Cromwell arrived he destroyed the uh, friary and the bell was thrown into the river and every seven years this uh, is still heard ringing and apparently if you hear the bell ringing it's not a good omen, it means that someone's going to die and what I found in the National Archives was with, with children talking about this and um, they talked about, oh, so-and-so didn't hear this, and they didn't hear this, so it can't really be true. So this was, you know, a nice little box that and we put together with the children. And then I also wanted to look at, as, as I was making these boxes, I wanted something very particular to Hedford, but also this sense of um, Hedford being connected to the outer world and um, this interconnection and, and interdependence. So this was um, um, a story a man from the town gave me about his great-aunt, who was born in a thatched cottage in Hedford, and she... Um, about, about the 1890s, and she ended up in Russia with the Tsars. She made her way from a thatched cottage in Hedford and became a governess teaching the Tsars. And in 1917, she was there when um, they had to escape. And she fled actually across Russia with cousins. Uh, she, actually was, she actually ended up being the sole minder of this child who was one of the cousins of the Tsars' children that didn't survive. And she actually was trapped in Hed not Hedford, in Russia for five years. And this was her story. And she finally made it back to Hedford after five years, and these, this great, so it was her nephew, but it was her great whatever. These were the, these were he had kept all the papers, so he really wanted this, and this one was on a in a shop, and so it was this idea of these histories and stories hidden in the town. This someone again, I tried to look with the children at, um, not just uh, uh, expanded this way, but also like deep deep time and uh, kind of a geological history. So this is the gentian that got left behind in Hedford by May Melton Glaciers. And at the background is um, the National Folklore Collection from Hedford of children talking about weather law and, and again, the curlew. And also all those drawings of the kids' drawings, they were helping put these <coughs> together. This is a quick one on migratory birds that land in Hedford and this idea of things passing through Hedford and spreading off. So we did a thing about the Arctic turn that comes from the Arctic lands in the lake and goes off to Antarctic. And this idea of part, people, things passing through, fishing in Hedford is very important by the lake. So these are the lace cottages, and I really was fascinated by this forgotten history of women, um, and very little was known about the lace-making cottages, only that an auctioneer had told me 16 years ago they existed. So I really wanted to find out more about that. I sent loads of emails around, and finally, thankfully, um, Dr. P Matthew Potter and Limbert got back to me. And this is the first text we had that there really was lace-making in Hedford. And, and it's a very romanticised piece about lace making, but it shows that it really did actually exist. And that not only it was, it was unusual because it was actually a hundred years before um, a lot of lace making in, in, in Ireland. It was 1780s it started, and it was a, a local landlady who um, used, you, uh, brought this trade to uh, specifically for widows to give them some kind of income. And so obviously I made a, a box. I really wanted to research that a bit more and again these were little glimpses really which, were, which all could have been developed 
and um, that little <coughs> piece of lace, it was the only piece of lace that we have in Hedford that was passed through the families and it's the Hedford Lace and Esther will tell you more about what we did with that. And again, one reference to the um, history of lace and Hedford is mentioned beside Limerick. As a textile artist, obviously when I met Selma, I was very interested in the project that Selma was doing for the nesting lark and at the time I was working as the administrator for that project. Um, but the conversations that started with Selma's work really got the community talking together. So um, being a textile artist, the idea of lace obviously fascinated me. So the first piece of lace, as Selma mentioned, that we came across, we do have a sample of it. It's from 1904. It came from a family that used to live in Hedford Castle. And the castle was burned in 1906. So this is still with that particular family. And knowing a little bit about lace making, I looked at it and knew that it wasn't crochet lace and that it looked to me like it could be bobbin lace, but I knew nothing about bobbin lace. And so um, we started our research. So the first thing I would say about getting involved in a heritage project from an arts point of view is to kind of have a good story to tell. So this really fascinated us, the story of lace making in Hedford. And not just the romanticised version of it, a beautiful piece of lace and, oh, wasn't it lovely? We knew that this was um, linked to a lot of hardship. And so we don't have a photograph of the cottages in Hedford with the lace maker sitting at the door as described in the historical references that we found. But the photograph here is showing some of the weavers in Donegal. And it just strikes me this might be something like what New Street looked like. The lady in the portrait is Anne Stepney, and we have traced the history back and believe this is the Mrs. St. George that introduced lace making to Hedford. So we have a reference to it, a secondary reference, and we're kind of on the search of a primary reference, but we'll get there eventually. We um, also looked at the census information, and we can see from 1901 and 1911, we have identified some lace makers. But again, being connected with women, um, sometimes the history isn't recorded because the head of household's profession is recorded in the census, but not the wife. And so if the woman was a widow, then her profession is listed. So if she's a widow, you may find lace maker. And in this particular record there, you can see that her, her profession is lace maker. So that took us on a journey of gathering a little team together, my, myself and Selma, got together with a friend of mine who's a crochet teacher and a member of the traditional lace makers of Ireland who are based in Cork. And we took a trip to the Museum of Country Life in uh, Castle Bar. And when we got there, uh, we met with Jackie Magnan, a Dutch lady living in Cork who is a bobbin lace maker. And she had seen our photograph of Hedford Lace and replicated it. So we knew we had found our teacher. So she came back, she came onto the, onto the team with us. So we made a plan. So after you've got your story, then we feel you have to have a good plan as to what you're going to do with the story. So we wanted to revive the skills of lace making, but we wanted also to make the story um, a new story that the next generation could pick up. Um, the, uh, the, the bones of our plan was really to do workshops, skill making workshops every quarter, if we could, get Jackie to come every three months or so. Um, and teach a class. So she could take eight in every class. And so we have managed to fill those classes since we started over a year ago. So we've done five Hedford Lace weekends with eight beginners each time. So we're up at about 40 lace makers in the west of Ireland making bobbin lace that, you know, had completely died out essentially because when we went looking for our tutor, we couldn't find anybody in the west of Ireland who was a bobbin lace maker. Um, Moving on from that, we kind of re recognised that the skills alone were probably going to appeal to a niche audience, and we certainly wanted the story to be a bit livelier and to engage with the full community. So every time we do a weekend, we have a public talk, and we try and change the topics around and invite different elements into it. So, for example, in April last year, we had a vintage tea party, and so we took the community hall over and dressed it up and had uh, vintage music and a gramophone outside and... Um, we basically filled the hall, which is often quite, quite a quiet community hall, so it came back to life with the story of Hedford Lace. We also participated in the International Lace Day, which we came across on social media. And to do that, we wanted to put Hedford back on the lace-making map. And so 
uh, you can see a little map there in International Lace Day where people across the world were making lace on this particular day. And so the Headford Lace Project is now on that map again. Um, where you see the two of us sitting, myself and Juliana, sitting, making lace in Headford on the street, trying to bring back the story of lace making outside the cottages. And we did that in front of the mural that we had commissioned from a local street artist. For Culture Night, we tried to add on different elements. So one of the things we did was to project the story of Headford Lace onto the side of a, a, an empty building so that as the sun went down, uh, people coming through the town would see the story of lace. We also commissioned another local artist, a puppet uh, theatre artist, to create these little selfie station for us, this little selfie station on the main street so that on Culture Night again, as people were walking through the town, that they would engage with this story in a, do, in a new way, take their photograph and then post it to our social media. So by going to our social media, then they're reading a little bit more again about the, the heritage of, of Hedford lace making. In addition to that, we also wanted to engage with um, you know, the men in the community as well. We wanted them to see that lace making, although it sounds like it was something specifically of interest to the women of Hedford, that there were, that the, the whole community was involved in this particular activity. They would have needed bobbins to make their lace, and so the men's shed, uh, a local community group, got involved with this, and we uh, commissioned a local wood turner, uh, a master wood turner to give them a course in wood turning and specifically to try and make bobbins for the project. So uh, you see three of the people from the men's shed and Eilish, who's also on our committee. Eilish, uh, I should talk a little bit about our committee actually because um, our committee is formed of a very diverse group of people but all of them have unique talents to bring to the mix. And Eilish has a background in performance in theatre. She's worked with the Black Box Theatre, the Druid Theatre and Machness. Juliana, our Brazilian on the committee, has um, a background in uh, producing arts programmes in Brazil. And uh, we also have Rusty from Portland, Oregon, who himself is a knitter and um, is a harp player and is a potter. So, you know, we have a real mix of talents on the committee, but we also have good organisational structure. So we have a, a very definite plan to expand Headford Lace Making into a story that uh, crosses all those disciplines as much as we can. We have big ideas, very little funding, but big ideas, and we go after funding kind of doggedly until we get something that will help us deliver something. So we've, we've currently on the go a commission to make a bench which will go into our community orchard. We're hoping to work with an artist who will be inspired by the story of lace or by the lace itself to create a unique bench that, yes, it'll be a piece of just public furniture that you can sit on, but it will also uh, allow the audience to kind of ask the question, why is the bench you know, looking like that? What, what story does it tell? So that's one project we're, we're hoping as well to um, eventually perhaps open some kind of heritage, cultural arts and tourism centre where the story of not only Headford Lace but also Ross Herley and all of the other local heritage sites can be brought back to life. That we can bring our creative community from Headford into that centre to deliver a, a full programme of activities that will engage with the community and with visitors to Headford. So we've been very lucky. These are just some of the ways that we have funded and supported the project. Not all of these um, supporters have, have given financial support, but what we've got from all of them is either training or networking or access to archives or access to other groups who have done something similar. And so we've kind of shared experiences. So um, that gives you an idea of the various uh, funding uh, bodies that have come on board with us. So there we are, we're at 15, I think we're there. Thank you very much. Thank you.